The bandwidth for this episode of the Wild Boar Dog Podcast was provided by Dougal's Den, amazing finds for the furry kind, www.dougalsden.co.uk. And also Jontus Media, if you want a website for your business, www.jontusmedia.com. Well, good morning, Karen. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm a little bit tired. My legs ache after my marathon walk last week for Skinny Paws. So thank you, everyone, for the donations for that. We've got a lot lined up for the show today, haven't we? But first, we've got a bark. Yes. Uh, from from Marley. Marley Terrier. From Marley Terrier. Our long, long-loved, long-lived, long-loved, I don't know what the word is, correspondent who, you know, keeps us up to date with things from on, the dog world. On and, Twitter, uh, yes. On Twitter, yeah. And lots and lots of Border Terrier friends out there. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled that we've got a bark from Marley. Okay, so before we get on to the main items today, which is on separation anxiety, and we'll also be talking about dog birthdays, let's listen to Marley Terrier Bark. Well, thank you, Marley. It's really nice to finally have you on the show. Well, do you know what? Marley's voice sounds different to how I imagined it. Yes. <laughs> he, said, he said on the note that he sent it in with, obviously he gets his typist to send things in for us, and uh, he put possibly squirrel motivated and with Lola Terrier doing the backing vocals. So, uh, you know, I was thinking, what does this bark say to us? I think it says something's very exciting out there. And obviously I've got visions of this Border Terrier charging around while doing it. So, um, so I, I, you know, I love a little bark like that. It's really, really good. If this is the first episode of the Wild Poor Dog podcast you're listening to, and we're actually up to podcast 22, we often include a doggy bark. And if you'd like to send uh, a, a bit of audio with your dog barking, you can record it on your iPhone or your Android or any other digital recorder if you're a super audiophile there. Um, and you can send your doggy barking to podcast at intellidogs.com. And that's a new address for correspondence. Podcast at intellidogs.com. Well, Karen, we're going to start off by talking about doggy birthdays. And it's my Winnie's seventh birthday tomorrow. Seventh birthday. Do you know that's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? That, you know something? I, I thought I'd ask this question. And uh, you obviously know it's Winnie's seventh birthday. I'm absolutely awful at remembering birthdays generally. So uh, the first thing I would say about this is I hold my hand up and say, it's not that I don't care about my dogs. I do. But I do forget their birthdays. And the kids were asking me yesterday, when, when is, you know, well, I know, when is Bonnie's birthday? And I was thinking, oh, it's on the paperwork somewhere. I remember Pickle's birthday because it's the same day as my son's birthday. So I remember that one. But other than that, I'm terrible. So I thought I would ask on Twitter, um, you know, do, do people celebrate their dog's birthday? So do you want to hear what people said? Go on then. OK, so I got um, from Lindsay, who's from um, Bee Puppy Farm Aware, um, which is a brilliant organisation. Um, she sent some fantastic pictures and she said, yep, always homemade cake with lettered candles spelling out the dog's name and a special walk on the beach if, if they can and lots of presents. So she really, you know, celebrates the dog's birthday and she sent me some gorgeous photos. So I'm going to put those on the blog because they're just lovely. Um, Richard, who has Charlie and Tibby, says, um, we used to give the dog a mince pie with a candle on it. Um, sad that I had to blow out the candle and didn't get any of the pie. Um, now, I don't know about mince pie. You're not supposed to give your dog raisins. So don't give them a mince pie if it's a Christmas mince pie. But uh, if it's mince meat, I'm sure that that's OK, oh, as in yeah. minced beef. Um, Doreen says every day is a special day for our four. So oh. they don't have a special day, which I think is very sweet. Soxy says we all get a present a chew and mummy makes us doggy burgers for tea and then not everybody does it amy said um am i the only one who doesn't sorry in my opinion these are dogs who have no concept of it being their birthday and then she said please don't shoot me <laughs> <laughs> bang <laughs> yeah so amy i'm i'm it's not that i don't think one way or the other but i do forget and i i yeah so i just think it's really you know it just highlights doesn't it that i don't I don't berate people no. when um, they say, well, I, hu I humanise the dog. Yeah, well, they're part of your family. You don't think they're a person. Of course you don't. And they're not. 
but you know you have an emotional attachment with them and i think that's quite quite nice and if it gives you pleasure and the dog gets an extra treat okay why not yeah i mean i i i must admit i'm a bit of a soppy thing so uh, i don't give them st- i don't give them presents or anything like that sometimes an excuse to buy a new lead um you know things like that but you know, I give them something, you know, Bassett's are, are foodie dogs. So I give them something that they really like. So, for example, I'll give Winnie a piece of salmon tomorrow. Oh, a piece of salmon. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I'm coming it. around to yours when it's my birthday as she, well. <laughs> they, love fi- they love fish. They All my dogs love fish. So particularly the uh, the skin from salmon when it's all crusty and, and you know, sort of roasted. So uh, that that's what yeah, Winnie will not? be getting tomorrow. And no doubt Aggie and Tia will be drooling in the background. And, uh, well, this is the first time that, that one of the dogs have got a birthday since we've had the pups. I've still got three here. Um, so, uh, although one of them's coming to England. One really? Of them's go- yes. Well, well, one of the show dogs from the litter, who's with my friend Manette in Norway at the moment, he's going to be coming over. Darcy, he's going to be coming over to England to be a show dog. Um, but... Um, Dearborn, La Fameuse Dearborn, he is, uh, I had a nice email last week from a lady uh, who's got a couple of Bassets and uh, well we've been talking and uh, exchanging lots of things and uh, he's going to be going to Somerset in six months time when he's had his rabies shot and everything so that's really exciting. Oh, you see, so you know, when he'll be there in Somerset, avoiding the cider and you know, enjoying the warmer <laughs> weather, I think, from the sounds of things. Um, I think we've got one or two listeners from Somerset, so if you're down that way, you know, you know, do, do if you bump into a, a basset, a very handsome basset wandering about that's obviously been well trained because John's been on it since day one, <laughs> then you know, let us know. <laughs> that would be very cool. All right, then, Karen, yeah. should we get on to the main item then? Yeah, um, there's so many questions we've had from readers, so many, and there's so many issues that people want to to sort out with their dogs. So we're trying to deal with them one by one. One of the one of the most common ones that I get asked about is separation anxiety. Now, we we kind of give it a heading and we think, well, that's that's a term, but what we're really looking at is a dog that doesn't want to be left alone. A dog that may not be completely alone, but has formed a real attachment with someone in the family or, or, or another creature in the family and really cannot cope without them. That's really what it addresses f- for me anyway. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how to identify it. That's the first thing. And also how to help the dog cope, because that's really what we're looking at. If you think about it, a dog is a social creature, aren't they? I mean, they are social. They're sure. not all as sociable. Some some are really sociable and some are kind of take it or leave it. But you generally find that there is a measure of dogs that want to be, you know, in contact with something or someone. Usually the dog tends to really form a, a strong attachment or a strong bond with one of their owners. Um, often it can be with another dog that they live with. But the, usually when I get a call for separation anxiety type problem, it's that the dog is is getting very distressed when a particular owner is leaving the house. Now, everyday work, everyday life, you have to go out. You don't stay in your house all of the time. What do you do? Um, I don't know. If you, we did talk about this a little while ago, didn't we, when we were talking about the barking about one of your bats. Yeah, do you because, remember, John? Yeah, because Dearborn, actually, he, um, I think he had a bit of separation anxiety to begin with. Mm. He, mm. Um, he was, I think he's very, very, fixated on people he loves people and even now when we're out walking he is the first of the three dogs to pick up a person from miles away literally and uh, Mm. he expressed his anxiety through barking and a particular kind of barking a a sort of really stressed barking you know it's just something I've heard so many dogs barking over the years that I could really hear that you know there was something not right here it was almost like a yelp bark I think you hear all sorts of there, there are lots of things that indicate it there is like vocalization which we talked about so it would be barking or howling or that kind of issue where you your neighbors may tell you you know it might be that the first time you know about it is when your neighbor says gosh you know your your dog didn't stop barking all day but there are other signs as well when we're talking about severe distress, I mean, you may find that they, they, you know, they go to the toilet while you're gone. I don't just mean toileting. I mean, like proper everything comes out. Um, they can, you can come back. They can be soaked in sweat, um, shaking and getting stressed as you try and leave. Um, it can get really extreme. 
what I'd really like people to look at their dogs and think about, though, is, is to, to try and address it earlier than that. So it, usually the problems come to me when they're quite severe. And retraining a dog to cope with being alone is a very lengthy process. Mm. So it's much, much easier to get in there early. As I keep saying, you know, get in there early. Don't let it develop into a big problem. Um, you know, and usually I find that it happens where there's a really strong bond between the owner and the animal, where the relationship is, is very much that you've got this little shadow that's following you around everywhere, or sometimes a great big shadow that's literally stuck to you, like what we call a Velcro dog. You know, they're around you all the time. And, you know, you could, some owners will report to me on my behaviour report, you know, where I send them a questionnaire. First of all, it will be, I can't even go to the toilet without this dog kind of following me about. So... First of all, you have to look at the relationship and think, is this a bit too interdependent? Are we a little bit too much of each other's company that, you know, of course, there's a big plus when you're there and a huge minus because you're not there. Yeah, I mean, that's I, the first thing. Yeah, I'm going to say, I do think that um, we as, as as the pack leader, I don't like using that phrase, but, you know, as the human, the, the key person in the relationship, that we set the tone for it, don't we? That we as as owners have to be really careful about bringing this out because you know some of us really love having our dog around us all the time and call the dog to us and make a big fuss of having that dog with us all the time do you know what i yeah. mean yeah yeah i mean we took yeah well, we exactly i mean we talked about birthdays and how much we invest in our dogs and again i'm not i'm not telling people that they shouldn't do this what i'm no. trying to get across is if you find that your dog is very much a comfort object for you, then it's likely that that relationship is going to be reciprocated somehow. So um, I've seen clients where, you know, the dog is constantly, um, and I mean constantly, you know, that's always on their lap. It's always being stroked. It's kind of a real comfort object for them. And they're using the dog as a kind of making themselves feel less stressed, which that's what dogs do. That's one of the benefits of having a pet, isn't it? You yeah. know, you can stroke them and cuddle them and they make you feel better. And, the issue is, though, the effect that that might be having on the dog as well. Mm. So if you find that th that's fine, I mean, it's a perfectly healthy relationship if everything is going OK. But if you then find that the dog is very upset when you go, you're going to have to look at that relationship and think, maybe I can do things in a different way. Maybe instead of doing all of that, I could cool things down a little bit play with the dog in a way that gives them a little bit more independence, get them to do things that are more active for them to do alone or at least with your help but not with too much involvement. I often go in and I'll find that the owner is doing an awful lot of certain sorts of game with the dog. You know, they're doing lots of um, hide-and-seek type games. They're doing an awful lot of retrieve type games. They're doing a lot of very close clicker work or something like that. And the dog is really, really motivated by the person's presence. Yeah. So try and think of some games where the dog is not so dependent on you. So searches are a very good idea so you could put things out so the dog searches for them and try and get them away from you a little bit another part of, of training you could do um is to teach the dog to stay and leave them and then come back so basic sit stay or a basic down stay mm. teaching the dog that it's okay when you go out of the room for them to stay where they are because you are coming back mm. now what about this john if you say to your dog every time you leave i'm coming back or i'm going now i'll be back later what do you think that says to the dog? That's a cue saying, I'm leaving you. Yeah. Does the dog know that you're coming back? No. 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 So the next thing that I would say is be really careful when you have a depart, what we call a departure routine. Putting Your on normal music. routine, you know. Yeah. You could do, you do certain things that are going to teach the dog that it's fine. Not certain things that teach the dog that you're, you're, you're going out and you're going to be gone and they're going to be on their own. So our normal departure routine would be something at the moment, maybe like, you know, you start thinking about going out, you're looking at the clock, you're, um, you know, you're finishing your drink, you're packing the dishwasher, you're doing kind of chores that you normally tidy around before you go out the house and then you get your coat, you get your keys, you get, you know, so by that time the dog started working up, you're going now, aren't you? And oh, then yeah. you go, yes, yes, I'm going now. You know, Because what dogs you watch, to... don't they? They watch us all the time and they pick up these cues. The same reason that they know that the treat is coming from the left hand because you always give it from the left hand. You know how they fix on the other hand. I always try and vary it. Um, but I mean, exactly that. Put You know, you are setting up cues that you are leaving. So um, how do you cope with that, Karen? Do you, do you say you have a little sort of mental check to yourself to say, I must vary the way I leave? 
You can do that. What you could end up doing, though, is generalising all your leaving cues so the dog knows that even if you kind of think the very thought of it and go to go out the back door, the dog thinks you're leaving. So what we've got to try and do is you can vary the departure cues, but it's very hard to catch a dog out if they're really nervous about something. They will watch really carefully. Mm. What you've got to try and do is make it so that a departure cue is a it's a positive thing. Yes, you're going to have to pick up your keys. So if picking up your keys means that they run into their bed and do a down stay and get a treat and you go out of the room and then you come back, that's a positive cue. So effectively, what we're looking for are the cues that we talked about, but they need to be predictably good as opposed to predictably bad. You need to start with the, the main cues, decide what's happening with the dog, look at the dog's reactions. We've talked about stress reactions so often on this podcast, just to remind everybody, the dog yawning, the dog licking around its mouth, the dog's eyes rolling, lowered head carriage, you know, tail may be tucked under. You may see one of those, you may see all of those, but they might be very small. So do watch for those sorts of things if those sorts of things are happening that is the cue start that's the start of the the problem if you mm. like so that is where you need to act first it's easy for me to sit here and say okay you need to make it a rewarding thing instead that is where the long-term work comes in so you need to be very patient and make a list of those cues so if it is just when you pick up your keys and that's something that you could probably desensitize the dog to. But ultimately, the dog doesn't want you to go. So step back from that and look at it and think, right, I don't want the dog to be stressed when I'm not here. So first of all, let's try and do things while I am here. So that's my next point. At, at the moment, like what you might find is the dog's with you all the time. So to begin with, just start cooling things a little Try not to make quite as much eye contact with the dog unless you've given them something to do that involves, again, something that's away from you. And, you know, as you go around the house, just close doors. You know, close doors now and again or get a stair gate if you have to. If you can't close the door, mm. get a stair gate, go from room to room, close the stair gate, walk off, do whatever, come back. Don't say anything to the dog as you're going. Don't say anything to the dog as you're coming back. Make it a normal part of the day that there are short periods of the day when you're not there. You might have done that. So a lot of people know these first bits. But the next thing is to start going out of the house and then coming back and then going out of the back door, perhaps, and coming back. I had one client went out of the window because they didn't have a back door, which is the weirdest thing. But the dog has to nice understand you can well, you've got to get out of the house and you've got to come back and nothing bad needs to have happened. It's also worth remembering that generally the classical signs of separation anxiety are that the dog is um, at its worst for the first half an hour after you've gone. Yeah. I do advise clients to video it. Get, get, you know, it's so easy, isn't it now, John, to get, um, get a video to oh, record yeah. things. And you can get a webcam. You can get, um, I mean, it's, to me, the more difficult aspect, leave your phone running with a, with a video on it. You know, use normal cameras, have video on it. It doesn't need to be for long, but you can see what's going on. Yeah, so don't just an wait. idea. Yeah, get an idea of what's going on. What's the dog doing? Where are they pacing? Are they, are they pacing up and down? Are they, you know, and, and try and work on that. And if you are going to get a behaviorist in, obviously make sure the dog is healthy. See the vet first, mm. but keep that video because if you are somebody like me that's going to come out and see the dog, usually while we're there, the dog looks absolutely fine, don't they? You know, mm. I mean, they just do. So get, get to that point. Try not to make a big jump to, okay, the dog's, the dog's um, you know, I'm here and the dog's fine and I'm not here and now the dog's stressed. Try and work it gradually. And that is what makes this tricky. Um, there are I, other things you can do. Sorry, carry on. No, I wanted to say, um, obviously some dogs that get stress reactions like this, they become, they do a lot of damage. You know, they can eat the door up, they can bite into the wall. You know, these are the sort of things that I've I've heard of or, you know, from talking to I've other people it. with dogs. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. <laughs> um, and I do think it's very important, isn't it, Karen, to say um, to not reprimand your dog when you come back. Yeah, yeah, and I do, I you know, I did have, I've seen quite a lot of pretty destroyed houses. I've seen a kitchen that was nearly taken apart and, I mean, seriously bitten through. A lot of the wood had, had gone and floors dug up and doors ripped apart at the base um cushions gone everywhere um and it, as you come back and if you see that oh my goodness yes i can completely understand you're upset the dog's going to be stressed anyway you get in and see a mess no matter how tempted you are to go berserk at the dog you know get out of the room go out of the house go for a walk give somebody a call please please don't upset your dog don't stress your dog out already because the dog is then going to think next time 
they don't actually want you to come through the door either. So not, and they don't want you to go out because they don't want to be on their own. But then they start worrying about when you come back because when you enter that doorway, the last time you went berserk and frightened them to death. So they have this kind of mixed emotion, as anybody might, that you are an unpredictable person. Whilst mostly rewarding, there are times where you might be actually quite unpredictable and scary. And when people say to me, the dog knows it's done wrong, knows it, dog knows it's done wrong, it looks guilty. A guilty look from a dog is actually a dog's anticipation of something bad is about to happen, but it does not mean that they know what it is about or why they've done it. So sometimes you get this same issue with house training. The dog knows it's done wrong. They don't know they've done wrong. They know that you're upset. And when you give them credit for that, actually you start to feel a little bit sorry for them, don't you? Because you sort of think, oh gosh, you know, the dog can see in my face that I'm upset they're trying to appease me because that's what it is. It's an appeasement signal. You know, the dog again, lowered head, rolling eyes, head down, tail under, going, oh, my goodness. It's an appeasement signal. The dog is saying, please, please don't be upset. Yeah. Don't. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, it's it's hard, though. You know, we're human beings. We do it. So if you have done that and you've got back and gone Rah! at the dog, OK, it stops now. <laughs> yeah, don't do that again. Don't do it again. Think what was causing this. And if you want to put any energy and any effort into this, start at the beginning, like I've just said. Go back to the start rather than using up all your energy, getting annoyed about it when it's too late. Um, And, you know, like I say, it's also really upsetting to think that the dog's been desperately, desperately trying to get back to you or trying to escape from wherever they are. Isn't it important? Sorry, Karen, I was going to say, isn't it important to train up the dog you know, whether you've got a, a, a young pup or if you've got an, an you know, a, a rescue dog that's coming older, that you spend, you know, just, I mean, I even start off with just a, a minute or so. You go away, you come back, you, you know, reward the dog for good behavior. You, you stretch it out over a period of time. Like you said at the beginning, this is not something that you can solve in a couple of days or mm. teach in a couple of days. Yeah, they, they need to, you know, you, you want a dog as a companion, so therefore the dog cannot understand. They can't see beyond the front door. So if you go out to work, they don't know that you're going off and earning money and doing things that keep them in your household. They don't know all of that. So you need to kind of just teach them that it's no big deal. It's no big deal. I'm here. I'm not here. You know, if you make it a big deal when you're there and not a big deal when you're not there, you'll end up with what some of my clients had once where they had a very large dog that was a rescue They took a couple of weeks off to care for the dog when it was first there. And then they obviously had to go back to work. So the dog had got into a routine of them being there. When they came back the first day after leaving the dog, the dog had completely torn apart their hall. They couldn't get in the door because it had ripped up the carpet. It was, as I say, it was a large breed, completely shredded the carpet. They couldn't get in. They couldn't open the door. As they were trying to open the door, the dog was hurling itself against the door trying to get to them. Absolutely joyous, you know, desperate. Um, with with excitement because they'd come back, it would have been probably better to harden their heart a little bit as as they saw it and, you know, have the dog there and do the things that I've said, gradually teach the dog that we're not there, but it's fine. We're not there, but we're coming back. We're not there, but there's no big deal because we're here in a minute and then we're gone again and then we're here again and then we're gone again. So we don't really want those sorts of things to, to, to build up. That reminds me, when you come back to your dog, when you've been away, you do not explode with joy and go woo and rub yeah. their belly and be super excited. Am I right? Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? The first thing I want to do when I come in the door is just get up to my dogs and go, oh, you know, literally just sit there and have them jump all over me. But I know that if I do that, that's going to make it a really big deal that I've just come in the door. So mm. I don't want them to then think, oh, it's so great when you're here. It's so boring when you're not here. It's mm. so great when you're here. So actually, I want, I, I, I want them to think, Oh, she's here. Right. First thing we do, we just go straight to the back door and I let them out for a wee. That is the very first thing I do. I don't really talk to them, really. Mm-hmm. It's hard because I love my dogs. But straight out, straight to the door, take them out, let them go to the toilet. When they've been to the toilet, then they come back in. And then once I've taken my coat off, put my keys down, put the kettle on, you know, and then I kind of make a bit of a hello mm-hmm. and I leave it. Mm-hmm. And I do find that I have to counsel people to say, right, when you come in, set the timer half an hour or 20 minutes or 10 minutes if you can't stand it and work your way up and just come in and do some things and then sort of go, oh, hello. And an easier thing to do, in fact, is teach the dog to get on their bed when you come in. So you actually have a dog that will rush to their bed and sit there kind of really nicely instead of leaping all over you. What a great idea. 
it's it's just it's easier isn't it let's face it if you've got a sociable dog they're also going to be the kind of dog likely that's going to leap all over your visitors and everything <laughs> as well so don't train them to do it you know train them to jump on their bed so they'll go and sit there and sit there all in anticipation and then you can go over and tickle them when you're ready you know that's that's the nice thing and then you can go back to you know the other games that i've mentioned so do examine what you do examine it be be quite careful to look at it and think yeah, I'm not really helping this here, rather than, oh, the dog just can't cope. It's nice to be needed, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. What about crating, though? I mean, some people I know have big crates, and out they go, and the dog goes into the crate very happily, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big question, to crate or not to crate. And I think I've, I've been to households where, you know, an owner's, you know, they've, been, they've heard, put the dog in a crate. So they've put the dog in a crate, but what they've actually done is trapped the dog in a small space and the dog's fought its way out of the crate and usually got itself stuck or injured or dug up the floor underneath. Mm -hmm. I've seen a big line of carpet completely disappeared when um, a client that I then went to visit after they realised they'd got a problem. They'd been putting the dog in a crate and it shredded the carpet underneath the crate because it was trying to get out. So I think you've got to think of it in this way, in, in my eyes, that... The crate is a place of safety for the dog, just as a dog would go to their bed for safety or might hide under the stairs or go and hide under the bed or something like that. So a stressed animal might need somewhere to retreat to. If you've made sure that your dog is tired and they've got plenty of things that occupy them during the day, then they shouldn't get as stressed. They should be more inclined to sleep. But a crate can provide a safety spot for them if you need it. Now, in theory, then, you shouldn't need to shut the door on the crate, should you? Because the dog should take themselves off to the crate and lie there, and that's what they should do. Exactly. Ultimately, I say to the owner, OK, the owner is worried that the dog might destroy things in the house when they're not there because they might be a young dog or they might be a large dog and can get up on the worktops. That's common sense, isn't it? So I can understand you would want the dog with, with the crate door shut because you don't want that to happen. If you're going to do that, there have to be rules. The dog has to enjoy going in the crate and you have to spend time training the dog to Absolutely. enjoy it. Then you've got to make sure that um, you've spent all that time desensitizing the dog to your going out as well. So the dog has to be aware of that. Then, only then, once you've got that together, should you be able to think, okay, well, I might need to shut the crate door, but the dog needs to be in the crate regularly anyway. They need to be, when I say regularly, I mean like that's their normal bed. Mm. I don't mean you put them in there for hours at a time. I mean, anytime you need to answer the door and you're not sure about the dog running out the door, you could pop them in their crate, shut the door, and the dog should not react badly. No, exactly. Um, perhaps they sleep there overnight again. You should be at the point where you can comfortably shut the crate door and the dog goes, okay, night, night, okay, see you in the morning, and mm. the dog's perfectly happy. Mm. If you haven't even got that, you should absolutely no way just stick the dog straight in and expect them to No, it's just it. a stressor, isn't it? it it's, it's, it it's trapping the dog, and mm. the dog is going to be panicking because it can't get to you and in a very small space that is going to feel completely, you, you'll get a complete panic behavior. So if you're going to use a crate, there are rules. I do use crates for some dogs because I find that the dogs are stressed because of the fact that they're in the house and the house is quite um, big or noisy or there are other things going on outside that they don't like. So they actually do want to hide. Mm. And if the owner's not there to help them, then they want somewhere safe to go. So mm. that's how I use it. I use it as a safety spot. Mm. The added bonus is if you train it properly, the owner can shut the door and the dog doesn't care because the dog's in its safe place anyway. Yeah. So that is what I would use a crate for, for certain mm. Mm. I mean, I, I I think I use a crate occasionally for a bit of downtime. I mean, of course, I'm a different situation. I have six dogs. But there's one thing that I wanted to ask, Karen. What about those people that go, mm, I've got a dog who is on its own and he gets stressed being alone. I'll go out and buy another one to keep him friendly. Yeah. Keep him it, friends. It, sometimes it works well. But what you've again, you've got to be aware. I've seen issues where a dog's still really anxious and it's because they bonded with a person. It isn't necessarily that they don't want to be alone. It's that they don't want that person not to be there. So you do tend to find that they really fixate on a member of the family. And it, there's little triggers like people will say, well, he really loves so-and-so, but doesn't really love me as much. And then you make this list of family members and you find that the one that spends the most time investing in the dog is usually the one the dog is most attached to. If you bring another dog in that's not really going to change you know i mean it might it might if you've got a sociable dog and you know they just want company but you've got to be really clear that that is what's going to happen and then if you do bring another dog in 
you've got to be aware that they may they may not get on you know it's not a cure all the dog they may not get on they may hate each other you may end up having to separate both of them and they may make each other anxious so is, there are lots of pitfalls is it is it breed related in terms of anxiety because i mean there might be someone listening to the show who's not got a dog but is actually thinking about getting a dog um checking things out is there anything breed related um i think I think in the sense that some breeds are bred for a particular personality trait or a particular temperament. If they are bred to work with people quite closely, then in my caseload, those are generally the ones that seem to suffer more with separation problems because they are bred to be quite quite people-focused and quite sociable dogs. You do get some dogs that are not bred for that purpose, you know, and probably aren't really that people-oriented anyway, and they're generally the ones that don't suffer. So... I wouldn't necessarily pick just breeds because you can get a huge, huge variety within any mm. breed and indeed within any litter. Yeah. You know, you get some dogs that are very needy and some dogs that oh, really tell me about care it. less. Tell you know, me so about it. I think if you're going to choose a dog, you, you always want the dog in the middle. And that's a little bit of a warning, isn't it? Because if you've got a litter and you haven't got pick of the litter and you've got one dog left, what if it's a really needy dog? How, it, how you're not going to know? So yeah, and that's it, a, that's a really interesting issue because, of course, from a breeder's perspective, you've got a litter and there are different characters. I mean, I can say I've got you know three dogs here at six months, so this is the first time I've really had the opportunity to see their development all the way through. And you know, one of the guy, you know, Digby, he is the most laid back, secure wolf out there, uh, and Dearborn. He's the most lively, uh, energetic basset I've ever seen. You know, was he from the same litter? I can't. Yeah, and yeah. he's had a little bit of an issue when he was uh, earlier on, and that's that seems to have been gone over. But one of the things that I was thinking of, I was thinking in terms of one of the old, older podcasts, one of the pre earlier shows, we talked about activating the dog with something like a a Kong or one of those games. I do think when you're training a dog to begin with to enjoy the time that you're not there that things like you know kongs can be great to- you know great toys yeah absolutely i mean that's the other side of the the seesaw if you like is that you've got to keep a balance on how much attention and how much fun they have when you're there and you've got to try and bring it into balance with how much fun they're having when you're not there uh and uh, very often again i will hear that we you know that we leave them choose but they don't eat them while we're not there that is a sign that the dog is probably too stressed to even even spend time eating and they immediately pick up the chew when you're back and go yum 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 so Mm. what you've got to think is i've got to do some things when i'm not here that they never ever ever get the rest of the time so if you're going to use a kong or a hollow sterilized bone or something like that it needs to be so incredibly special and so tasty that the dog really really wants to do it Mm. and sometimes you have to do a lot of desensitization before they'll even get to the point where they feel relaxed enough to pick up that kong or that bone that's why it's easier to prevent it than cure it if you start with a puppy make it so that you know the second you're out the door the tasty thing's on the floor there for them and the minute you're back it's gone again you know, and then you're gone and the nice thing's back for them and then you're back and the and the tasty thing's gone again. So that you can train the dog to do that. Um, you need to make sure it's extremely high value stuff though. You know, oh, well, I, I'm glad I, I'm doing something right then. Yeah. That's no, exactly I mean, what I how I do it. I, I, I come back and I give them one of these big round balls with a hole in that lets you know, sort of key value treats out. So they play around with that. And then pang, yeah, that's exactly how I've done it. It works. And and making sure that the treats that you're giving them are actually decent. And I yeah, say decent, not just, I don't not mean just the regular kibble. I mean, yeah, yeah, you don't don't give them their ordinary kibble unless they're really greedy dogs, in which case, you know, you might get away with it. But if you are going to use something, it's got to be super, super tasty mm. and it's got to try and either be long lasting or as many of them as, as are going to help the dog last mm. for as long as you're not there, but not enough to make them fat. So you've got this kind of constant playoff. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of giving my dogs um, a hollow toy of some sort um, with some um, cheese spread, spread inside. Now, not filled up because you'll make them sick. Just enough, scrape round. Some dogs like that. Some dogs like um, meat paste, you know, that you'd normally put on your sandwiches. Um, uh, what was the other thing I tend to use? Some people like peanut butter for their dogs, you know. Um But the idea is that you don't just put a boring old biscuit inside a rubber Kong, which smells of rubber and biscuit that they get normally that, I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't be that interested. So you've got to make it delicious. Some people freeze a Kong, you know, they'll pack it full of stuff. Yeah. A little bit of non-salted stock in their meat stock, freeze it. 
um, and the dog takes ages to get it out. But yeah. you need to build up to these things gradually. It's no good just kind of dropping a boring old hide chew that they get all the time and going out and going, well, I left them a chew. It's it's a boring thing they get anyway, and you're not there, um, and you've got to make it, I'm not so exciting. Look, dog, here's a nice thing, and I've gone out of the room, so it doesn't make a difference to you. It's so- almost like some people don't want, I don't know, I, it's almost like well, they want to be needed and they want to be loved, but the flip side of the coin is the dog can't cope when they're not there. So we have to try and wind ourselves back a little bit from the dog, I think. I have one, la- one last thing that sort of occurs to me before we, we sort of start to draw things to a, cl- a close. And that's if I think about, you know, where I live, it's, there, there are quite a few people that commute into central Stockholm and they have their, their, their dogs. It's quite a doggy area. And they go out in the morning and everything is a rush business starts quite early here people have to sort of be up at about six to walk their dogs um and i often see people who don't exercise their dogs enough first thing in the morning then they rush off to work leaving the dog for maybe you know if they work part-time six seven hours five five hours (laughs) and um or maybe they have a dog walker come in in the middle of the day and stuff how do you feel about that karen is you know is the 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 long walk the good exercise before leaving the dog that's is do you see that as a key part of the process yeah definitely um you know it, it it's, it's part of having a dog, isn't it? And it sometimes can be an absolute pain. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm the last one to wag the finger at people because I know real life gets in the way. But I do think that if you it, what you're trying to do is increase the dog's, um, you know, serotonin levels, make them feel happier, make them feel more relaxed, make them feel tired. If they've had a good old walk and something to occupy their brain for a bit, um, and you know, that they hopefully drift off to a nice dreamy sleep and that'll be that'll be it sort of thing um, until the dog walker comes. There are laws about leaving your dog for longer than, um, I think it's, I can't remember what the Animal Welfare Act says now, but the RSPCA advised no more than three or four hours a day you should leave your dog. Really? Um, it's very, yeah, it's, 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 it, that's not the law, that's what the RSPCA advised, mm. but the Animal Welfare Act now talks about social welfare as well. Mm. Um, I'm not aware of any prosecutions yet, but um, I do think that it is brought to people's attention that you have a social creature it's not acceptable really to leave it for many many hours a day Mm. and when I say many hours I mean three or four hours is okay maybe a day occasionally if you absolutely got nothing else you can do but generally you've got a dog that wants to be in company with people and if you're leaving it on on it or or other dogs you're leaving it on its own all day it really doesn't have much to keep it happy and, and, and so yeah, taking it for a really good walk is a great thing. Getting someone else to do it. There are so many dog walking businesses starting up now. Um, I did a, a blog a couple of, um, well, it's probably about a week ago now, um, written by a dog walker about how to find a good dog walker and what to look for. You can also put your dogs in daycare. I mean, you know, especially if you've got a really severe behavior problem, obviously you get a behaviorist to help you. That, w- that would be the, the key. Check with your vet the dog's okay and not in pain. Get a behaviorist to come out and help you. Also look at the possibility of daycare because some dogs just cannot cope. They can't, you know, then they're probably never really going to be really, really tolerant of it or possibly enjoy it. So that's Mm. not a very nice welfare thing for them. Find a good daycare and drop the dog off at daycare and the dog will have more time with other dogs. And when you get home from work and you're tired and you're really shattered, so will your dog be really tired and shattered. So it's actually a win-win situation. It just, it does cost money, but pet ownership is expensive. Let's face it. Of course. Um, So, you know, there's lots of things that you can do. And I think, again, take control of the situation. Decide that you're going to do something about it. Decide that it's not the dog's fault on its own, but it's not all your fault either. You know, the dog might be a bit needier than the last dog you had or your neighbor's dog or something like that. But do deal with it. Do take take the bull by the horns and and just go for it and think, okay, if I can't do this, I'm going to try this and I'm going to do this. I'm going to make my dog happier. I'm going to be less stressed. My kitchen's not going to be torn apart um, and it's not. You know, you're not giving in by taking your dog somewhere like daycare. No, not at all. You're making things better for yourself and for your dog. So we've got a handout that you've prepared, Karen, for people. Yeah, there is um, a handout that goes along with this podcast, um, which is available for download um, off my IntelliDogs.com website. It's um, not intended for people who have a severe problem. Obviously, if you have a severe problem, you do need to get professional advice 
that is tailored to your needs. So do do bear that in mind. If you're stuck, you can go to the APBC website if you're over here in the UK, um, if you want to find somebody good. And I'll put the link on the uh, on the blog post for this podcast. Um, but by all means, if you're really struggling, do email me because it might be that I can get somebody in, in touch with you nearby. But yeah, there's a handout that you can download. Um, I'll put the link to it on the blog podcast as well, on the podcast blog rather. And it just gets you started. You know, that's really what we want. And when you go to get the uh, the download, the, uh, the the handout that Karen's put together, to get that you have to sign up for a nice little newsletter list so that we can keep in touch with you and send out some, uh, you know, just keep you in touch with what's what's happening at IntelliDogs.com and direct you to other useful pieces of doggy news. Yeah, I should point out we don't spam, you know, on our mailing list. We don't send spammy stuff. We don't sell your email address on to anybody else. So if you want to know doggy news from me, that's what you get. You know, you won't suddenly start getting weird requests for money from Nigeria or <laughs> or affiliate you know, links or all that or kind affiliate of affiliate links. No, that's not that's not what I want to do, and it's certainly not something I would like either. And if you don't, if you decide you don't want to subscribe anymore, you can just click unsubscribe, and it takes you straight off the mailing list. Yep, so no yeah, but worries. but but we like we love hearing from people um, and and hearing about your doggy stories and also seeing your pictures. That's oh, brilliant. I love yes. seeing photos. Yes, we need more. <laughs> I think we need more pictures and more barks. All right then, Karen, I think it's time that we wrapped up the show for this week. Um, remember, if you want to get in touch with Karen, you'll find her on Twitter, and that's twitter.com slash wildpaw. Or if you want to send me a tweet, you'll find me at twitter.com slash John Buskell, J-O-N-B-U-S-C-A-L-L. If you have a question or a comment, you can tweet us, or you can send us an email to that new email address, and I'll remind you again, and that's podcast at intellidogs.com. Com. So, Karen, what are you up to next in the wonderful world of dog training? Well, um, I've got a lot of work to do at the moment on, um, I've got some behaviour reports to write and things like that, but I've also got a fascinating um, charity event that we're doing at the moment called Skinny Paws, which I mentioned at the start of this podcast. Now, last week, Davina McCall's trainer, Jackie Wren, set us a marathon walk challenge. We had to walk a marathon in a week. And um, yeah, and, and it was about four miles a day, two miles on one day and then four miles on all the other days. And I completed that at about half past 10 last night with, with, with my little dog Pickles faithfully by my side. So lots of air punching and leaping about in the village last night while neighbours looked on wondering what on earth I was doing. But thank you, Jackie, for setting that challenge. And we have raised some money for that. We're still raising money. It's for um, medical detection dogs, which are dogs that save lives with a sniff. They can detect cancer. They can detect um, drops in people's blood sugar who have hard to control diabetes. They are amazing. So I urge you, if you if you have any spare pocket money, please donate to the charity. Um, I'll put the link on the blog um, site again, but also you can go on to justgiving.com slash skinny paws. And this week we are doing Madonna's workout. So you'll have to visit the skinny paws site to go and go and see what we're doing there. But, Madonna's um, workout? Yeah. Does that well, involve you know, dressing like, like Madonna? Oh, <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, I hope not. But it's it's like Madonna, you know, she's so she's she's incredibly fit. I don't necessarily want to have her physique. I think she's a bit more toned than I'd like to be. But certainly, you know, I'm getting married in, in what, five weeks time now and I would love to have a bit more toned arms and things. So I think her workout is lots and lots of repetition, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of repetition. I don't think I'll make it up to her totals of like two hundred and fifty arm lifts or whatever it is she does, but we're gonna give it a go. All right then, Karen. Well, until next time, if you're a new listener, thanks very much for listening to the Wild Poor Dog podcast. This was episode 22 and uh, we'd love for you to go back and check up some of the older older episodes, which you'll find on iTunes. And if you're a regular listener, thanks for coming back. And it's about time you sent us uh, a tape or a bit of audio of your dog barking. See you, Karen. Bye. The bandwidth for this week's Wild Poor Dog podcast was provided by Dougal's Den, amazing finds for the furry kind, and you'll find them at www.dougalsden.co.uk. And it was sponsored by my company, Jontus Media. If you want a website for your business, get in touch and you'll find us at www.jontusmedia.com.